From the Cleveland Museum of Natural History, it's the Soro Podcast, Science Out Loud. I'm your host, John Mangles. Our special guest on this video edition of the Sora Podcast is author Margot Lee Shetterly. Her best-selling book, Hidden Figures, and the Oscar-nominated movie it inspired, tell the previously unknown story of an extraordinary group of female African-American mathematicians known as human computers, whose work at NASA in the early days of the space race helped astronauts reach orbit and return to Earth safely. Ms. Shetterly recently received the Anisfield Wolf Book Award, which honors authors whose books help public understanding of issues of race and diversity. Our interview took place in Cleveland, where she attended the awards ceremony. Margaret Lee Shetterly, welcome to the Soro Podcast, and congratulations on winning the Anisfield Wolf Book Award. Thank you. It's great to be here. You were born and raised in Hampton, Virginia. That's the home of NASA's Langley Research Center. Your father worked there as a climate scientist beginning in the 1960s. It was a conversation with your dad that really sparked the idea for Hidden Figures. Can you tell us what he said that, that captured your imagination? Right, so uh, it was actually what he said and then what my husband heard that, that turned into Hidden Figures. So. Um, as you mentioned, my dad, uh, he's now retired, but he worked as an atmospheric scientist his entire career at NASA Langley. And uh, my husband, Aaron, and I, he's also a writer, um, we were visiting my parents over Christmas in 2010 and um, had just happened to run into one of the women who had been a mathematician uh, at NASA and um, who had retired many years prior, who was in her 90s at that time. And uh, that sort of sparked a conversation with my dad about the women, what they had done. Um, there were many uh, human computers who'd worked there and- Did happened. you know what that term meant when he said it for the first time? Uh, vaguely, I guess. You know, you grow up in working or having a parent who works at a place like that in a town where a lot of people are technical. And you, you hear these things, but you, you don't necessarily think about them, especially growing up in an era where a computer was a piece of hardware. So we should briefly explain that when you say computers in the book, you're talking about not electronic computers. I, I am talking breathing. about a job title. Uh, the same way a dancer is someone who dances and a trucker is someone who drives a truck, a computer was a someone who computed. Um, and a human computer, really, this is a term that um, that uh, the, the addition of human really shows that the default computer for us today is an electronic computer, whereas the computer was unmodified. It was just a computer. This was a person back, back in those days. And what did he tell you about these women who were working about uh, as computers at this time, really not just early in the space race, but prior to that? Prior to that, exactly, um, in the, the, days of, the early days of aeronautics. Um, he had tremendous respect for these women. He talked about how smart they were, um, what outstanding mathematicians they were, that by and large they were at the top of their class. Um, just really amazing, interesting, and talented people to work with. And what said to you, what spoke to you and said, there must be a book in this? Uh, it was literally the voice of my husband. <laughs> you know, he. Who said I there think, must be a book in this? <laughs> who said this, there must be a book in this. Um, but you grow up and you take certain things for granted that NASA's there, that there are women working there, that many of them are African American women, that um, the space program happened and the, started in the, the town where I grew up. And then you get the perspective of somebody who is not, and they can see things with fresh eyes. And so at the time my dad was talking about these women and, oh, Katherine Johnson, who calculated the launch window for the early Mer Mercury missions very casually, um, my husband was like, wait a minute, I don't know anything about this history. Um, I've never heard these stories, and why is that? And so for me, it was a moment of saying, wow, that's, this is pretty neat, this thing I grew up with. So l let's focus on that. I mean, from the Wright stuff to Apollo 13, I mean, the space race has been incredibly well documented. Mm -hmm. And NASA itself has a very active history office. How did historians manage to miss this? Well, you know, I think the thing is, um, first of all, NASA actually did document 
um, some of this. You know, NASA particularly and the, Catherine Johnson's uh, particularly role. Catherine Johnson's story, and then you know, kind of the the larger cloud of women. Um, but it certainly was not popularly um, known. Um, but nor really was the work of women computers who worked at any number of different installations, including the Army, the you know Naval Research Laboratory, Lewis Research uh, Center here, Lewis in Cleveland. Research Center here, you know, which is now known as NASA Glenn, um, Bell Labs, which is the precursor to AT and T, um, very similar to the work done by the women at Bletchley Park in the UK, which I think a lot of people know about. The now. Code Breakers, right? The Code Breakers. So um, it's only recently that. In general, this work being done by women, this, this mathematical, analytical work, is coming to the fore. So, um, uh, and I, I really think that um, it, it wasn't, you know, I think we have this idea of a scientist as the lone genius working in a room, um, usually male, usually white, um, some crazy guy who is socially inept and who, uh, you know, gets the answer to life itself and becomes a famous scientist. Even that idea, you know, really uh, obscures how much of science is done in teams, uh, how hierarchical, there's, there's a lot of division of labor. Um, and in that division of labor, a lot of that heavy computing, very necessary but very tedious um, and considered, you know, not to the level of that crazy mad scientist, a lot of that work was done by women, and, and because of that, it was invisible. And, and did the fact that it was done by women trace back to World War II? Is that why so, so many young women with mathematical skills were employed at, at Langley? You know, it actually predates World War II. The first computing pool at NASA Langley uh, started in 1935. So it was before World War II, but it was during this, this big push um, for aeronautical research and, you know, the airplane really turning from this novelty invention into something that was becoming an important machine of transportation and obviously later of the military. Why were women cast as computers? I mean, why was that considered a female role? Uh, well, you know, the first five women, there were five white women who made up the first computing pool at NASA Langley in 1935. Um, the engineers, I mean, this is a very tedious job. It's a really necessary job, but it's, it's a time-consuming job. You know, sitting there with a mechanical desktop calculator, uh, a, a data sheet, and a pencil, and a slide rule. It's, it's an extremely manual, labor-intensive kind of job. So anything that you could do to streamline that work would make the entire aeronautical research process a lot more efficient. So um, the engineers thought, well, Maybe we could streamline this in the same way that we have a clerical pool to batch process our clerical work. Maybe what we can do is batch process this, this mathematical work. So they hired the first five women. It was a great success, and they decided we need to get more women in here. But the added benefit, I mean, first of all, they were, they were very good at their jobs. Again, these were women who were at the top of their class, um, extremely good mathematicians. Um, but because they were women and because they were hired in at a sub-professional level, even if they were doing the quality of work that would uh, otherwise qualify them as a junior engineer, um, they were paid less. They really weren't even, at, at an early point, called mathematicians. They were called, what, data analysts or some other term? At the fr and in the very beginning, they were called computers. Mm. They were called computers. And then what happened is, as time went on, um, the, the name changed, and uh, data analyst, math aid, um, so there were, you know, there were lots of different bureaucratic titles. Right, as, but as nothing they, that really did justice to the skills that these women brought to the job. No, I mean, mathematician, the women, so for example, Dorothy Vaughn was one of the few women of, of any background who was hired in as a mathematician. So she had a professional ranking when she first came to the NASA Langley Research Center in 1943. And that really, uh, in terms of the, the federal bureaucracy, put her on a level with a lot of the men. But most of the women were hired in as sub-professionals um, and were given the title computer. And, and to go back to the earlier point about how um, this, this collaborative effort had really largely gone overlooked, you weren't even able early on to get any kind of account of the number of women who served in this role, right? That, that's correct, and I am still trying to, um, to do that. I mean, the thing is, uh, 
a lot of these women, as, as, you, as you alluded to earlier, a lot of these women did come in during World War II. The earliest ones came in 1935, but there was a boom um, in the 19, uh, early 1940s. Um, as America entered World War II, um, Roosevelt demanded uh, significantly higher production of airplanes. The need for aeronautical res uh, research escalated. And as the men went off the war, you had this skyrocketing demand and a decrease in supply of, of mathematicians, and women stepped into that breach. And he also issued an executive order that allowed African Americans to, to work in the defense industry and in federal go jobs at about that point, right? That is correct. Um, a lot of times we think of we think of civil rights. We think of Mar Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. as as being you know the figurehead of the civil rights movement. Well, uh, decades before that, a gentleman named A. Philip Randolph, who was the head of the largest black labor union in the country, the the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, um, he organized a march on Washington that never actually happened um, on the eve of World War II, but to put pressure on Roosevelt to open um, those civil service jobs to African Americans. And that, you know, that is sort of the two-pronged increase, decrease in the supply of labor um, and allowing women to come in and that executive order opening the door to African Americans, that's what really uh, allowed the first black women to get those jobs at Nessa Langley. I, I want to ask you uh, about the dichotomy of, of that work situation, because on the one hand, clearly those women who arrived were entering a, a segregated and a sexist situation. There were signs that restricted where black women and men could, could eat, where they could use the bathroom. Mm -hmm. Um, the women couldn't uh, attend executive meetings. They weren't allowed to play on the golf courses where, as we know, business get, often gets done. Mm -hmm. um, uh, women were uh, really looked at as, as not uh, functioning as analytical workers. They were really the sort of the piecemeal workers. But at the same time, I mean, as you point out in the book, this is the, 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 the palace of aeronautical research and the jobs that women had there were relatively well-paying, and they were making contributions. How do you think Katherine Johnson and, and Dorothy Vaughn and others dealt with that, that sort of dichotomy of, of the work environment? Well, the thing about the work environment that time is that it mirrored every other aspect of society. So whether they were at work or whether they were at the Greyhound bus station or, or whether they were um, it was a restaurant that they couldn't go to. That, um, that segregation followed them absolutely everywhere they were in their lives. So to, to a certain extent, you know, that was the operating system um, in the South. This, this door opening, uh, what it really meant for those women, um, they would get paid two or three times more than they were getting paid as a teacher. So right. I think any of us can do the math and say, okay, here's a job that's gonna, that, you know, I'm going to be very good at because I, I'm a mathematician. I'm going to work as a professional mathematician. They're going to pay me two to three times more, and I'm going to get to work with the best people in the world, not just in the country, in the world doing that work. Um, that, that's a pretty stunning door to open um, for you when you're someone like a, a Dorothy Vaughn or a Katherine Johnson who previously hadn't heard of that kind of work. Um, if you were a woman, of any background who was good at math and who had studied math, who'd gone to college for math, the most likely outcome is that you would become a math teacher. Maybe you could become a math professor, either at a woman's college if you were a white woman or at a black college if you were a black woman. Um, but this was something that was completely new and changed not just the lives of those women, um, but their, their families, um, the community, uh, so it, it was, you know, it, there was this dichotomy of uh, an, a work environment that was segregated both in terms of gender and in terms of race, but it was a tremendous opening for these women and their talents. You write that Langley was a place where blacks were ghettoized, but also given unprecedented access to the professional world. Absolutely. I mean, at this time, again, if you were a professional African-American woman, 
being um, a teacher was the most likely outcome. And you know, the vast majority of women who worked outside of the home did work such as cleaning houses or you know, cleaning the Langley Research Center even, um, that kind of thing. So um, this, this really was an unusual job and an unusual opening for a black woman. Do you think the nature of the work that the computers were doing helped somewhat level the playing field? I mean, you also, uh, again, to quote you, you write that uh, Katherine Johnson told some of her students later in life, math was either right or wrong, and if you got it right, it didn't matter what your color was. Yeah, you know, she's, um, just a note on Katherine Johnson, she just turned 99 years old. And um, the, the NASA Langley Research Center in two weeks is going to be inaugurating the Katherine G. Johnson Computational Facility. Oh, uh, they are naming a building for her down there. Um, and, is she going? Uh, she is going. Um, I'll be there as well. And, and when she speaks, she does say that. She's like, that's one of the reasons why she gravitated to math. Math is either right or it's wrong, you know? And um, I do believe there's something about the scientific mind um, and the, the nature of scientific research that made it easier for these women to come in, you know, these women who were very good at their jobs, who were good at math, who had a way to prove themselves, and to uh, use that intelligence to blunt perhaps some of the stereotypes and the, the, uh, the prejudices that may have otherwise faced them. Margo, you mentioned Katherine Johnson, who is, is still vibrant at 98? 99. 99. 99 year. years old. Don't want yep. to cheat her over here. <laughs> um, you obviously have talked to her multiple times. You interviewed her several times, and I guess have kept up with her since the book and the movie have come out. How has she um, dealt with or embraced or enjoyed what's come about this late in her life? I think that it has been fun for her. Um, she is somebody who, uh, I mean, honestly, people have been writing about Katherine Johnson for decades, albeit in local media or black newspapers or, you know, NASA-related publications. You but, certainly elevated her to a much higher stage. Well, you know, she, she is someone, I think, who really, in addition to being um, so brilliant, charismatic, like, uh, you know, worthy of, of all of this acclaim in her own right. I think that she's also somebody who has helped us understand and focus and see all of these other women and understand what they have been doing and also understand the, the behind the scenes work at, at NASA itself. You know, we see the astronauts, we see some of the engineers, you know, mission control, but um, there are a lot of people involved in this work and I think that Katherine Johnson and her story has really helped us shine a light on all of those people. My sense of her from reading the book is that she very much is about teamwork and group effort. And I'm just wondering how, I mean, obviously she, of the three that you focused on, really she's, she's the one that's still alive. I wonder how she felt about sort of getting the lion's share of the attention. Does she, does she talk about Dorothy and Mary and, and Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, she is, um, she knows like anyone who works at, at NASA or any kind of organization that the only way that you get success is by working in teams and by having smart people around you and getting the best out of each of them. Um, she was the first person who told me uh, about Dorothy Vaughn. I had not heard the name Dorothy Vaughn. I had known um, of Mary Jackson because she worked with my dad. Um, Christine Darden, who is in the book, she's not in the movie, but she um, is a younger generation. She's my dad's generation, um, was you know my father's peer. Dorothy Vaughn was somebody whose name I hadn't heard and didn't know, and Katherine Johnson was the one who first told me about Dorothy Vaughn and told me that she was the supervisor and told me just what a brilliant woman that she thought Dorothy Vaughn was. Um, so many other women, like um, Marjorie Hanna, who was the very first um, supervisor of West Area Computing, the segregated group. She was a white woman. Um, the guys that she worked with, Katherine Johnson is very generous in terms of giving credit to and talking about the achievements of the people that she's worked with over the years. You paint such vivid portraits of these women and I'm wondering with those who are no longer alive and particularly someone like Dorothy, whom you hadn't heard about before, how were you able to, to kind of get such a, a rich sense of what they were like as people? 
The first stop was really the interview. So talking to Katherine Johnson and getting as many uh, recollections as she could tell me about Dorothy Vaughn. Things that uh, Christine Darden could tell me about Dorothy Vaughn because Dorothy Vaughn was still there at the very beginning of Christine Darden's career. Um, anyone who worked with her. Um, I tracked down a professor who um, had been, was a young professor at UVA in com computational sciences, or you know, I can't exactly remember what they called it at that time, but um, had sent a letter to Dorothy Vaughn's boss um, telling, her, telling the boss what excellent work um, uh, that Dorothy had done. So the, you know, these different colleges would come and use the computational facilities there at NASA Langley. Um, and I tracked him down and had a conversation with him about Dorothy Vaughn. Um, her family, obviously, amazing um, just time spent with her family, listening to memories of, of her and her gestures. You know, they, they would tell me all of the gestures that she made and, and what kind of a person she was. Um, and then there, there were so many documents. So, I mean, I would just track down anything I could that had to do with this story. Phone books, um, seating charts, photographs of uh, uh, the, the wind tunnels, the, the facilities there at, at Langley, um, you know, uh, photographs of different work groups. Uh, the black newspapers, absolutely indispensable resource when it came to figuring out parts of these women's personal lives. So a lot of the details about their personal lives and the community um, came from the black newspapers, um, the local Virginia newspapers as well. Um, essentially anything that I could find to track down um, either uh, an artifact that related to their personal lives, um, you know, even school papers and things like that. I'm trying to imagine your filing system <laughs> in doing this. It must have been pretty incredible. And the fact that you're doing this as a first-time author, I know you came from a magazine publishing background, uh, also in the financial sector, but this was your first book. Uh, why were you not just completely daunted by the scope and the depth of this project? Uh, you know, I think if I'd really known and had experience with what I was getting into, maybe I would have been daunted and should have been daunted. You don't know what you don't know, though. You don't know what you don't know. Um, but I was just transfixed by the story. I, I really, I had to know what happened. You I, had I to knew, tell it, it sounds like. I had to tell it. I knew part of the story. I knew what it was like growing up in Hampton. My, uh, my career and my life and my circumstances um, were very much informed by the fact that my dad had this great job at NASA Langley, um, that my mom was an English professor and worked at Hampton University there in town. You know, so this story, in a way, is my origin story. And, but there were so many things that I didn't really know. I knew a lot about the space era. Um, because uh, my dad was working as that was sort of, you know, had peaked and then winding down. I didn't know anything about NASA during World War II, really. Um, and that was some of the most interesting stuff of all. That era was particularly fascinating. I, I felt like I knew a lot about the history of the early space race, but the, the pre-space race between World War II and really the early 1960s, uh, I, I thought it was a, re a revelation reading the book. I. I I couldn't believe it. I, I, I simply had not known how important the Hampton Roads, Virginia area was to, to World War II. That it was the, uh, I think, second most overpopulated, overcrowded, frothy war center in the entire country. Um, that people came from all over to go to, not just to NASA, but you know, there was an army base, you know, the Norfolk Naval Shipyard, the Newport U News Shipyard. It still is a tremendous defense community, um, but that really kicked off during World War II. And I, I just, I didn't really know about that. And speaking of pivotal roles, there's a wonderful scene in the movie which arises from the scene of the book where Catherine is, is tapped to verify the trajectory calculations that a, a computer, an electronic computer in this case, ha had made mm -hmm. to support the first flight of John Glenn. Um, let's take a look at that scene for a second and then talk about it. That's such a marvelous scene. Um, but what's interesting to me is that while Catherine's calculations really gave John Glenn the confidence to go forward, she didn't see that as the penultimate achievement in, in her career. She really thought of something in the Apollo program. Can you, can you talk about that? 
Yes, I mean, it's, it's really fascinating that um, I think because that was such a dramatic moment, um, this, and a pivotal moment in terms of the space race between the United States and the Soviet Union, that's the moment that, we, that, we, that history remembers in terms of Katherine Johnson. But what she herself is most proud of, and I, you know, I asked her this question, um, she contributed calculations to Apollo 11, the moon landing, um, in which she helped calculate trajectories of the, uh, so the, uh, the Apollo uh, spacecraft actually was two different parts. One part, which was a lunar landing, which descended down to the moon's surface, and another part, which orbited the moon while the astronauts were down there. The command module. The command module. And so what she did was to provide some of the equations that helped sync up this orbiting module with the module down on the, the lunar surface so that this one could come back up and the astronauts would go home safely. To and allow them to rendezvous, because if they missed that if they missed meeting the, point. If they missed the bus, as Catherine Johnson <laughs> said, there was not another bus coming. No so, pressure there. No huh? pressure there. Um, and again, you know, this, this was also uh, a tremendous team effort. I mean, 400,000 people contributed to that particular success. Um, but Catherine Johnson played a role in that, and she feels that that was her most con important contribution to the she space program. Had, she had an opportunity to, to actually move to Houston and to be part of the space task group, which had relocated from Langley to Houston, really, I guess, to support uh, the Apollo program. She turned it down. Do you think she regretted that? Uh, you know, I, I don't know. I, I don't think so. She's, I mean, the thing about these women that, that was also really interesting and I wanted to capture in the book is that they, uh, they had rich professional lives and they had rich personal lives. And her family was there in Virginia um, and she wanted to stay there. And there were, there were other people um, who made that decision as well, who had the opportunity to go to Houston but felt like their heart and their family was there in, in Virginia. And, and what they also knew, though, is that even though the heart of the space program was moving to Houston and mission control and everything that we think of when we think of the space program, there was still a lot of really amazing work being done at NASA Langley, not just in space, but also in aeronautics. And I think that's such an important point, and one that comes through vividly in, in the book and also the movie, is just how supportive and how much collegiality and camaraderie there was among this group of, of the West computers, mm -hmm. uh, outside of work as well as in. I mean, they really were a support network for each other. They really were, and I, I think it's an interesting situation. Again, when we talk about the, um, this sort of inside out issue of the segregation that happened inside uh, the Langley Research Center. On the one hand, um, it was segregated. You know, they were in a separate office. They had separate bathrooms. They had a separate cafeteria. There's, there's no way that you can look away from that and, um, you know, not understand the implications of that legal segregation. Um, on the other hand, what that did was it meant that none of these women had to come into that situation alone. That they had a support system. Um, that they were able to pass the word through their social networks about the job openings, that Dorothy Vaughn felt, Trip in particular, um, a sense of responsibility toward these women and their careers. Um, so they were able to, to give each other the support that they might not have otherwise had if they had been simply one woman, um, you know, an otherwise all white or all male organization during those times. I wanted to ask you particularly about Dorothy and about Mary. Um, you know, obviously Catherine had a, a long and successful career with NASA, as did the other two women, but th there was a little bit of a, a kind of a bittersweetness it seemed to me, about um, later things that occurred in, in Dorothy and Mary's life. I mean, Dorothy actually had to, to give up her job supervising the West computers when they were absorbed into other jobs at Langley. Uh, and I know she was really in that role, a, a mentor, a champion of so many other women. Mary also, at, kind of later in her career, felt like she'd hit the glass ceiling in terms of being an engineer and moved over into hu human resources. What's your sense of how fulfilled those two women felt about their computers, their careers at Langley? One of the things that I, I really loved and that I really identified with um, learning more about these women is that they were ambitious. You know, I think yeah. a lot of times you get uh, stories about women and 
that that ambition, the personal ambition may be mitigated, you know, that, that you don't get to kind of look at square in the face and say, wow, you know, they really wanted that job. And I think the thing that I, I really loved about these women is that uh, is they were ambitious. You know, Dorothy Vaughn was a supervisor. She, after they disbanded the very, segregated Very, very early group, on, too. Very, very early on, yeah. And then in uh, 1949, she was made acting supervisor of the group. 1951, she was made the supervisor, officially, of the group. Um, and when they disbanded the segregated West Area Computing Group, she always hoped that at some point in her career, you know, which would, would go into, um, into 1970, um, she always hoped that she would get another shot at a supervisor job. And that never panned out. It never worked out. You know? And that she could be a supervisor in that integrated environment where she worked with men and women, um, black women and white women, that you know, wouldn't that be amazing for that to be the way to end her career? And, and it never happened. And, and of course, naturally, I think any of us um, having a similar kind of ambition and that kind of talent would feel that bittersweetness. Um, in the case of Mary Jackson, you know, again, another very talented woman, ambitious, worked very hard. Became an engineer very, Became very early when that really early. wasn't happening. Yep, 1957, um, and did produce a lot of research and also hit the glass ceiling. And her decision, um, really what she decided was the way to get the most out of the remaining years of her career was to help other people. So empowering she really, them through her work in human empowering, resources. Exactly. Um, so she took a demotion, actually, left the engineering track, and went into human resources, where she really became a professional advocate uh, for other women um, of all backgrounds there at the center. So that, you know, that decision, being someone who had that talent, who was good at engineering, um, but who hit the ceiling, and to make that decision to go into human resources rather than just coast for the final part of her career, I think that's, that's a really gutsy um, and principled move that she made. I wanted to ask you about the movie. Um, you, you just talked about amb ambition in these women, and, and my sense from Catherine in the book was that she was incredibly ambitious and incredibly confident in, in what she was doing. I, I got a little bit of a timidity from her in, in the movie portrayal that I, I wondered how you felt about. You know, the, I have to say, this, this thing of having a book turn into a movie and have um, the, the book with the expansiveness of a book, you know, the, the time the rich and the space that you can add. and yeah. the context, and then taking it to this form that is it's very limited. You know, you've got two hours to tell this story in a dark theater. And that's it. And you've got to basically get the whole idea to the people and you know, laugh, cry, and clap at the end, whatever. It's, <laughs> right. it's got to happen. Um, it was difficult for me to let some of the, the, the sort of uh, documentary facts go and to understand that in order to tell a story um, in that format that, um, you know, that the filmmakers uh, would take license, you know, that would take liberties. And, um, you know, I think for the arc of the Katherine Johnson character in the movie, uh, having her be more timid makes the, the scene where she kind of, you know, tells her, tells the Kevin Costner character, you know, you're the boss, you just need to act like one. Well, you know, I think that gets a little bit more of a sting. It heightens the contrast, It heightens it? the yes. contrast, which movies are about to right. a certain extent. Um, and, uh, you know, the real life Katherine Johnson is, is you know, extraordinarily confident, um, very calm, uh, very much whatever room that she walks into, she is the equal, at least, of everybody at who's least, there, regardless yes. of who is there in the room. Um, right. But very generous in spirit and very kind. Um, and so, um, but it, it, you know, I think that that was one of the things that I had to learn and to learn to let go of um, was that people who were telling the story, you know, understood the form of that medium and were going to supply what that medium needed. There was some fascinating insight in the book um, that, that really stayed with me. Um, you write how in the early 1960s, the optimism of the space race and the optimism of the civil rights movement were really linked. They were sort of ascending together. But by the end of the 60s, that sort of diverged and to the point where uh, there were actually protests at, prior to the launch of Apollo 11 uh, by civil rights leaders, uh, black leaders, who, who felt that 
time and money and attention were better spent on problems here on earth, particularly those of, of uh, the impoverished and the, and the dispossessed. Um, I, was, I was fascinated by that. And again, it's something that, that I, I was completely unaware of. Can you talk a little bit about how, how that optimism faded and, and what would that have felt like to someone like Catherine or Mary or Dorothy who were so enmeshed and in, 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 invested in that program? but could kind of see, I'm, I'm guessing, the other mm -hmm. side of the argument there. Right, well, I think with, you know, 1969, it's, it's, you know, almost 50 years ago, almost five decades ago, the moon landing. And from our vantage point here, I think that we see it through the rose-colored glasses of history. And we think of it as this great unifying moment in the United States and that it was something that everybody was in favor of in the United States. When that simply wasn't true back then, um, there was a lot of discord about, well, why are we spending money on this very expensive program? When we have a lot of pro problems here at home that could, uh, that could use that money. This is also a time when the Vietnam War is, is escalating and becoming very expensive. So um, there are a lot of things happening, 1968, uh, King is shot. There are, you know, riots in, in many cities around the country. So this idea that we're spending millions and millions and millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars to send, uh, you know, a few white guys to this rock in the sky. And no black guys, no women. And exactly. Why are, why are we doing that? What is the point of that? You know, um, whereas I think in the, uh, in the early part of the, the program when it was really about competition with the Russians. There was this very direct goal um, of beating the Russians in space. Um, at the same time, like 1963, there was you know Martin Luther King and his I Have a Dream speech, speech in the March on Washington. There was a greater sense of optimism. Do you think the, the women of the West computers felt pulled in those different directions? I do. I mean, they were, they were full people. They had multiple identities, as do we all. They, they loved NASA. They loved their work. Um, they got a tremendous amount of satisfaction from NASA. Um, they were African Americans in the segregated South. Um, you know, they were absolutely aware of living with a lot of the issues that, that people were uh, protesting against and fighting for and, and complaining about. And so. And that they had, in their own ways, protested against in their work environments, too, right? Absolutely, in their work environments. Um, in the case of uh, Christine Darden, who was much younger, but she was a student at Hampton University and participated in the sit ins. So these women were absolutely doing what they could to further those goals of the civil rights movement and to further the goals of equality for everyone in our country. Um, you know, at the same time, um, you know, Katherine Johnson wanted, you know, as much as anyone else working at NASA to see NASA take the next step and to go beyond the moon and to start exploring Mars and the outer planets. Um, and I think she really, you know, talking to her about that, a little bit about that, um, I guess, I don't want to say it's a contradiction, um, but she always, and, and everyone that I knew who was African American who worked at NASA, including my father and Christine Darden and all of these other people, have always been evangelists in terms of getting young African Americans and young women into the space program and into the sciences, and always understood that, uh, that science and social progress could go hand in hand. You just mentioned um, young girls and STEM education. I'm guessing that you have heard from lots of young girls and women who are interested in careers in the sciences, technology, engineering, and math. And I'm sure this book has had a tremendous impact on them. What do they say to you and what do you say to them? And how can that interest be nurtured? Uh, you know, I have been blown away by how this book has, um, has captured uh, the imaginations of a lot of different kinds of people, but definitely women in the sciences and technology is the core constituency. And I have had everything from really little girls who like math and science and feel like, oh my gosh, I, you know, I want to be like Katherine Johnson, to women who are retired and who say to me, I wish I had known that this was out there, that I spent a lot of my science career alone or the only woman on a team. And I wish that I had known I had this sisterhood there. Um, you know, I hear from the parents of, of students, um, both fathers and mothers, who, who feel like this is you know, a great thing for their 
their, not just their girls, for their boys as well, but uh, you know, particularly for their girls. I had one woman um, uh, tell me on Twitter that her daughter had been, I think she was you know, like in the fourth grade, so nine years old or so, um, had been dragging her feet in math and not getting good grades, and she saw hidden figures, and then her mom said that her daughter told her, told her the numbers started going into her head just like Dorothy Vaughn. And it just shows you the power something like that has to say, listen, you, you can be a girl, you can be African American, you can be whoever you want, and you can also be a scientist and a mathematician and really good at it, and also really love it. That this is this can be a really cool, interesting, and fun gig. You can have a job have like Catherine that she just couldn't wait to go through to every day of her life. Every single day. I mean, and she means that literally. When you ask her about her career at NASA, she said, "I loved every single day about it." You know, she is someone who knows how to count very well. When she says every single day, she means, she means every single day. That's incredible, and it must be, have been really rewarding to you to hear that kind of reaction from readers and see the impact the book has had. It, it, has, been, um, I, it has been amazing. Um, the enthusiasm for this book and this history um, and these women who are just amazing role models, great Americans, um, it, it's been off the charts. Tell me about the Human Computing Project. One of the things that was frustrating, uh, both exhilarating and really frustrating about the early research or the continuing research um, into hidden figures is that there were so many women. I mean, it started with Katherine Johnson, it started moving out from there, and what I realized is that there were hundreds of women at NASA and that they were part of this entire history of women in computing um, that nobody really talked about um, and nobody really put into the context of, of the advances of science and technology. So this is really a way of trying to unearth those women individually in their stories and also to try to put some numbers on, on the women and to really understand how many of them were working there, where did they go to school, uh, what kind of career paths did they have, and what can we learn from that for, uh, for policy and for understanding how women move through STEM careers today? How are you doing that? I mean, is there a, a contact point or a repository for these stories? Uh, there's a website, thehumancomputerproject.com. Uh, it's sort of, I'm, you know, sort of balancing the jobs of hidden figures and, and that. Um, but, you know, one of the things that's really remarkable about um, the internet is that people can find you and people will email me and they say, I was a computer back in 1957 at uh, NASA Glenn. I knew somebody who was in computing and, and um, I want to tell you about her. Sometimes people send me an obituary. Um, a lot of times it's something that is a line in a woman's obituary. Maybe she worked during the war and either uh, stopped working and, and went back home or moved on to another job. Um, and it, it's something that uh, the people around her don't know that much about until she dies. And so um, I am just amazed and just um, really exhilarated and inspired by the numbers of these women and the breadth of the work that they did. What's next for you? Where do you go from here? Uh, well, the best thing about Hidden Figures is it has, uh, I can call myself a professional writer now. Um, I, it, this is by far the best job I've ever had. It is, it is so much fun. And um, what I'd like to do is to keep con telling these kinds of stories. Um, I am working on another book, um, with, also with African-American protagonists that takes place mid-century, the same time as Hidden Figures. Um, and instead of scientists, this is a story about business people and entrepreneurs. Um, so I'm, I'm just at the very early stages, but I, am, uh, I cannot wait to really roll up my sleeves and get back to the research. I'm intrigued. I can't wait to read it when you write it, as I'm sure many others can't wait as well. Margo, thank you so much. It's really been a pleasure talking to you. John, this is great. I, I really appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the Sora Podcast. Our audio engineer and editor is Matt Crow. For more information about this episode, visit our website, cmnh.org slash Sora Podcast. You can listen or download past episodes on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Stitcher. Please join us again soon on the Sora Podcast for more conversations about science. I'm John Mangles. <laughs>